This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this week's episode, he's taking a look at even more weapons from Team Fortress 2, and in this process, is slowly losing his mind. And then we have this thing, which is, I swear this has been included just to break my mind. There's no physical way that this thing could work. If you want to see more of Jonathan reacting to Team Fortress 2 weapons, make sure to subscribe and check out the previous video we made on Valve's classic shooter. And if you'd like to help out the Royal Armies Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, over to Jonathan. Okay, pause there. Right, here we are again. The short stop. Uh, short stop is actually a, a very apt name for this weapon, uh, the real version, because it's only really any use at very close range. Now that's obviously not the case in the game. This thing is reasonably long-ranged and apparently absolutely devastating. Here is one. This is the COP Derringer, which is a four-barrel, 357 Magnum slash 38 Special, because you can fit whatever you can fit in it. You can shoot, essentially. <laughs> Looks much like it does in the game. It works much like it does in the game, except you can't just flick it forward. You, you have a, a catch on the top to unlatch the barrel, which feels a little uninspiring and, and flimsy, but is... Um, there's enough metal there to keep this thing shut. And interestingly, the 3D model for the game does actually model this latch on the top without the ears on it for opening it up. It's a surprisingly accurate rendition of the gun, I think. The notable difference is that the gun in the game has a whacking great hammer modeled on the back of it, although it doesn't do anything because TF2, um, whereas this is striker fired via that horrific trigger. <laughs> Right, interesting name here. Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol. Now, superficially, this looks a bit like one of the kind of vest pocket pistols of the 1910s, 20s. FM Browning, 1905, Colt 1908, that kind of thing. Very, very small, literally, vest pocket pistols because they fitted in a vest pocket. And the name, Pretty Boy, presumably refers to Pretty Boy Floyd, who again is a Prohibition era gangster who probably had one of those vest pocket pistols. But then when we load into the game, the thing is immense. So I, that's probably a joke. That's probably a deliberate in-joke that this is a pocket pistol, but we're gonna make it huge. We've got a bizarre reload where he flips it over forwards, having ejected the magazine and slaps in another one from the top and then flicks it back round again. Good luck doing that with an actual 1920s pocket pistol. That's impossible. In fact, they, they have, even the ones with button magazine releases are, the, the magazines don't drop free. You have to pull them out Put another one in. But who cares? It's Team Fortress. A bit of video gaming history here. This is something people in the comments last time were alerting us to. So this is the rocket launcher from the original Quake game this game does draw upon pretty heavily so of course they put in the actual weapon from quake and it's even held in a central position in the middle of the uh, bottom of the screen just like it was in quake the early 3d graphics of, of quake don't really lend themselves to detail but this is the same design but given some more detail with those weird exhaust vent things around the muzzle interestingly in the little character picture on the bottom left of the screen we we see him holding it on his shoulder like a normal rocket a normal <laughs> rocket launcher from Team Fortress. But um, yeah, in the actual first person view, it's where it should be for Quake. And then of course, I think as I commented with the other rocket launchers, the rockets do have that slow vapor trail design to them. So that's a nice little homage there to uh, the original as they, as they call it. Uh, another shotgun. This from the from the the way the front from the cocking tube, the way the cocking tube is mated to the barrel, and I always feel daft trying to ID real weapons from this game because I'm not always based on real ones, but surprisingly often they are. That appears to be our old friend the Ithaca 37 shotgun, except that it's got an ejection port on the side of it, um, and the Ithaca both loads and ejects from the bottom of the gun. So that's a, I'm not even gonna call it an error because this is not in any way meant to be realistic. As to why it's in the game in that sawn off configuration, I think that's got to be an aliens homage because of Hicks with his antique pump action Ithaca. That's my guess anyway. It could just be the model that they chose. Speed, you magnificent bastard. 
another one of these fascinating magazine-fed rocket launchers where we somehow stuff a load of rounds in the front of it and then we can fire them out in sequence. Uh, needless to say, as you can tell from my smug grin, that's that's not how these work. Although, as I think I mentioned last time, there was a system called Metal Storm that did work in that way with electrical ignition and superimposed loaded munitions. But clearly, that's not what they're going for here. This is just a, a cartoon bazooka. So I think this is meant to be, it's clearly meant to be a US bazooka. It's got a, the white star on the side of it and the name of it with Liberty in the name. It's meant to be a bazooka, probably the, either the M1A1 or the M20 Super Bazooka. One of those with a with the sort of cage protector on the back of the of the launcher and the big blocky pistol grip with a stirrup guard on it. Uh, again, we've got recoil modelled here, so it, imp it implies power with a with a weapon when something recoils like that. But uh, neither recoilless weapons nor rocket launchers, which is what this is, they shouldn't be recoiling. Both systems equal out the recoil by the way they're designed. So they shouldn't, shouldn't really move to the rear at all. Our old friend, the Milcor grenade launcher, uh, has made another appearance here in essentially Warner Brothers style. Now this works pretty much like it does in all other games with the rotary magazine drum. Although the grenades in this kind of tumble out of the muzzle in a weird sort of way. It's almost like it's a grenade thrower rather than a grenade launcher. Breaks open like the real thing, kind of functions like the real thing, has the usual controls on it that don't really do anything for, for Team Fortress, and the strictly cosmetic iron sights. I'm kind of intrigued by how you can just randomly insert the grenades vaguely in the direction of the gun and they go in the right place, even though he's, he's not turning the, the cylinder or putting them in different chambers. You just, just shove them in, close it up, crack on. Right, well this is apparently an unremarkable sticky bomb launcher, which I think has to be deliberate sarcasm, because there is no such thing, needless to say, as a sticky bomb launcher, and so any such weapon would by itself be remarkable. And from thence the humour arose, I suspect. Interestingly, this looks like it's based on the Chinese QLZ-87 semi-automatic grenade launcher, which is much longer than this in real life, but has a similar drum magazine type arrangement. I suspect that's what they're going for, but it could be an original design. It's got a weird, weird design, drum mag, very short barrel. Loading is affected not by replacing the magazine or by loading rounds into the magazine, but by uh, molesting the weapon repeatedly until it refills by <laughs> cranking the cocking handle back and forth. Um, I, I, I like the idea of a, of a different explosive weapon so that the little bombs have spikes on them, they stick into things, they blow up. It does what it says on the tin. I'm gonna have to pause there because we've got a, a brief sighting of not a gun, of a claymore, not a claymore in fact, but a, a two-handed sword, clearly based on the one from Braveheart, which was also not a claymore. Um, <laughs> we won't go d too far down that rabbit hole. A, f a fun thing, a fun weapon to incorporate into a first-person shooter. I'd heard that it was in the game, but that's the first time I've seen it. Well, we had some variants, effectively, of this last time. The minigun, which is what it is, really. I've got one behind me again. But this is the vanilla version, I gather. Uh, it's got the extended flash hider, effectively, is what that is, which you'll see on some mountings of the minigun. Uh, others will, won't have it. Depends what sort of vehicle or aircraft they're mounted in, what sort of pod thing they're in. It's got the a huge ammo drum thing on it which looks more like something like the Vulcan or the Avenger cannon the 20 millimeter or the 30 millimeter big brothers of the minigun uh, which is called the minigun because it's a mini Vulcan aircraft cannon because it really isn't that mini but it's mini relative to a 20 millimeter cannon so there's no there's no absolutely nothing I can say realism wise because it's just not in any way it's not meant to be it's based ultimately on, I guess, the chain gun from Doom, in that most miniguns in games can probably trace their inspiration to that, which was erroneously called the chain gun, is actually a type of Gatling gun. It's a trope of video game gunnery at this point. <laughs> Right, 
Right, this is a surprise. The classic. I'm not sure in what way it's a classic, but this is a Heckler & Koch G36, or very close to it. Well, not very close. It's like a sort of Funko Pop version of a G36. And also, for some reason, it's a sniper-type rifle. So it's got an exaggerated long barrel, what is actually a battlefield optic with a, a red dot sight and a low magnification optical sight. Unexpectedly, it's not semi-automatic. It's somehow a bolt action, although I don't think I've seen a bolt on it as yet. For some reason, it has what looks like a Picatinny rail under the carrying handle where it wouldn't be super helpful, although you can, in a real gun, remove that whole carrying handle assembly. But the real gun has a cocking handle in that position that flicks out to the side and you use it to cock the gun. But this doesn't need that because it has a magical bolt handle somewhere. I've just also noticed the front sight has a big old fashioned ramp foresight on it that cannot possibly function because there's a load of gun in the way of it and no rear sight. But the front sight is below the line of the hand. It's, it's kind of blowing my mind slightly, so I'm gonna stop. Three, two, one. That looks an awful lot like a jar of piss. Am I, am I watching Postal 3 or am I watching Team Fortress 2? <laughs> Okay, we have a crossbow. Uh, not something that we do much of here, but we do have a good collection of sporting crossbows from the medieval period, the Tudor period, Stuart period, and a handful of military type crossbows as well. The closest equivalent that I can offer you for what we're seeing here, the Crusaders crossbow, which is clearly, despite the name, actually quite a high tech bit of kit. Closest thing we've got would be Big Joe. This is Big Joe, who looks not a million miles away from the Crusaders crossbow, I suppose. Now, for those of you who are wondering, what does it shoot? Quite lightweight steel and aluminium bolts. And the heads on these are, well, they're like uh, Type 16 medieval arrowheads. So, a surprising real world parallel, I guess. Um, I mean, you have to squint pretty hard to see the, the similarity, but it's the closest thing we've got. So let's see how this thing works. Right, well that's not a crossbow, is it? That's a gun with a crossbow prod stuck to it. It's not cocking in any way, there's not even a string. It's it's not a crossbow. It's more like Chewie's bowcaster, although I think that those, those crossbow-like protrusions on that are meant to do something. Uh, there's nothing on this that seems to function. It's, it's even got a gun barrel on it, this thing. Now there are forms of bow that have a, a, a supporting tube for the, for, the, for the bolt that's like a barrel. But um, yeah, this is, this is something else. Stand next to the bomb. This is actually a very good representation of a Nagant model 1895 revolver, which is what I'm just offering up to the screen to just assure myself of how accurate it is. Now you'll notice how lovely and shiny and well made this is. This is from the, the actual Nagant contract. Before the Russian production line was up and fully up and running, a number of these were made for Russia in Belgium by the company that originated the design. So it's a little bit fancy compared to your typical Nagant revolver. But it works the same way with a loading gate on the right hand side. And you just load and extract. There's a there's a, a rod extractor here that you pull out, swivel, and use to knock out your empties. That would be a bit of a faff in the game, so they've departed back to the, the more usual way of doing things by having a swing-out cylinder. But there's no mechanism on this gun or in the model in the game for actually swinging out the cylinder. It should be fixed, and it should be loaded through a loading gate. So it's kind of nice and reassuring to see a real gun at last. Sentry guns are real, or at least nearly real. We have the technology already, the, the AI, the software, the hardware, to identify, track, and fire upon targets. 
We, we have it, we could do it right now, just like aliens, just like this. We don't do it typically because there's that fear of removing the human from the loop. Because what we do have are remote weapon stations and unmanned ground vehicles, UGVs, that are increasingly actually seeing service. And with a controller, you can use those weapons against the enemy. What you can't do is have it programmed to attack on its own. Where Team Fortress really does depart from reality is to have to have too many guns on any kind of system like this, I think is excessive. The ammunition requirements would be too high, the weight would be tremendous. So this is something we're gonna see become increasingly real in future. Remote weapon stations with rockets and guns, absolutely. We'll probably also see systems that will identif uh, identify, track, and ask permission to fire and then permission will be given or the fire button will remain a human activated button but we are almost there and then we have this thing which is i swear this has been included just to break my mind there's no physical way as if you didn't already know this that this thing could work. So it's yet another pump action shotgun. It's got yet another non-functional hammer on the back of it. Another non-functional bolt on the left side, which really ought to be on the right. We load it by kind of wafting underneath it, implying that we're loading a tube magazine underneath. And yet it has a drum magazine, and the drum magazine is mounted just under the muzzle. And I don't think I need to explain why that's not in any way realistic. Join us again next time for another one of these. If you'd like more in the way of firearms content, we've got a series over on the Royal Armouries channel uh, featuring me as well. If you'd like to support what the work that we do here at the Royal Armouries with this collection of, of stuff behind me, uh, you can find links in the description. But otherwise, I'll see you again next time.